The stock market gains have been led by tech stocks, more specifically FANG stocks, as central banks have been buying billions to support their prices. As a result, institutional investors have followed along, adding billions on top. Then the retail investors have become little minnows to the big fish, using the momentum to their advantage. But what happens when the sentiment changes? You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we are going to look at what has happened within the tech sector and, of course, the rest of the stock market. Let's begin by taking a look at this. It might be hard to read the font, but the top chart is Facebook. Then we have Google and Amazon all going back quite far, particularly with Facebook taking the lead on the losses here in the last trading session. And you could see this is the chart showing you the FANG stocks and how quickly things can change. They're racing the gains of several days prior to it. We heard what happened with Facebook. They're in trouble in the news right now. And then you'll see the NASDAQ compared to the Dow and the S&P. So obviously the NASDAQ took that nosedive. However, it still pulled down the Dow and the S&P with it. And that's the way that things go. Because you could have a problem which is supposedly isolated to one particular stock or one particular sector, but it doesn't work like that. There is always a ripple effect. All right, look at this. The S&P 500 moving below its 50-day moving average, and if memory serves correctly, the Dow Jones moved below, below its 100-day moving average. And you'll see this, some odd occurrences. Now, we have Facebook here moving down. You can see, in fact, all of the tech stocks moving down, but one that really stands out to me clearly is Netflix. This company has defied gravity. Absolutely. There are many, many accounts of this particular stock burning through money. Now, yes, they've been getting more subscriptions. Yes, they've been doing this and that. But ultimately, it's not looking good when they're doing so well in terms of their equity performance. And yet, their company has some work to do. But ultimately, nothing really matters. All that matters is how much central bank and institutional investor money will flow in to a particular stock. That's it. Fundamentals do not matter anymore when central banks have destroyed the markets. Speaking of central banks, I've shown you this before, but it was very relevant. In every major market shock since the 2013 taper tantrum, central banks have stepped in. Okay, this is a fact, absolute fact. Even if verbally to protect markets, they have their forward guidance policy. And essentially what that means is they will come out, they'll make a statement to reassure the market. So they don't necessarily need to change their policies, but all they need to do is use quote unquote forward guidance and they will be able to stabilize markets. Following the Brexit vote, markets no longer needed to hear from central banks as they rebounded so quickly that central banks didn't need to respond by the dip has become a self-fulfilling put. And that's frightening when you think about it because they're not reacting to the actual um, you know, trigger events. They're not reacting to fundamentals. They're not reacting to different indicators. They're simply just buying the dip. They're simply just going with the fact that, yes, central banks will be there to bail me out. And that's a dangerous policy because you ultimately are relying on another group of individuals who, quite frankly, don't have your best interest at heart. You could see here, again, basically how it shows you through here. Every time it dips down below a certain level, they'll just pick it right back up. Whether it's happening naturally, whether it's happening by central bank intervention, You'll see that right here, and it basically breaks down all the different events. I won't get into it, but I'll move on. Goldman Sachs, everybody loves them. Well, take a look at this. Future liquidity disruptions may amplify price declines when the current cycle turns. This is Goldman's co-chief markets economist. Trading liquidity may be worse than it looks because trading volume in many major markets is increasingly dominated by more speed and less capital. Of course, high frequency trading has been a very, very big problem. Although that, 
you know, these big corporations have been able to profit from it. It's not a good thing in the long term. Of course, this is going to be huge in the next downturn because it's going to change in a second. You're not going to be able to react. The warning on fragility came days after the bank said in a note on Friday that investors need to get used to lackluster returns as volatility picks up and stocks and bonds move in a more tandem with each other. The sell-off in U.S. tech stocks sent the VIX futures curve into backwardation, a telltale sign that the market is under stress. Near-term contracts became more expensive than longer dated counterparts because, of course, they don't know what's going to happen in the near future and they're worried about it, and so they should be. U.S. debt to GDP ratio. One of the points that I want to make was, since the financial crisis, it seems to have hit a top of about 2.5, and it can't really go over this. And I thought that was interesting. And that's a total. We'll see if this continues because it is starting to pop above that now, but we're going to see. Taking a look at households, businesses, federal government. You know, when I look at this, I need to understand which sector is really the ones that have been affected. And you can see here the deleveraging on the household level, because I believe this is actually incredibly important, although the markets don't. Households, how much debt do they have? There was a deleveraging that occurred in the U.S. That deleveraging didn't occur in other countries, however. Look at Canada, for example, where that deleveraging process, basically it was a little blip on the screen and it just continued on. So their crisis, where they're experiencing in different markets, particularly where housing prices had really just continued to escalate while the U.S. subprime crisis was a dramatic disaster in the U.S., Certain areas, they just kept going. So their crisis is going to be much heavier, I believe, than the, uh, than the U.S. when the time comes. Look at this. You're seeing this out of the Wall Street Journal, I believe. In the sixth, is the sixth time the charm, the Federal Reserve has raised short-term rates five times since late 2015, but banks largely stood pat on deposit rates for rank and file customers. Now with the Fed expected to lift rates again this week, there are signs that this could change. Wow, take a look at this. Your certificate of deposit, one year certificate of deposit or CD, rose to, wow, 0.49%, that's amazing. So the central banks have been consistently raising interest rates, and you have not seen the benefits of that. And that's the interesting thing. Historically, as interest rates rose, the banks would give you, you know, a little bit of a boost. But this time around, they're just keeping the profits. Falling behind, deposit rates haven't kept up with the Federal Reserve's rate, rate hikes, one-year CD versus the Fed funds rate. And you can see how they've been hiking this along the way. However... Take a look at the green line, the one-year CD basically moving up slower than they can, you know, ever think of. It's just insane because the Federal Reserve have been increasing so slowly. It's not as if they've been doing it so fast that they can't keep up. It's that they're just taking more profits. They don't want to give people an incentive to invest in their savings accounts. They want to say, hey... Get into this other asset we have here. You know, it's a, it's a mutual fund, it's a stock, it's an ETF, it's this or that. They don't want people putting money in the banks. That's something that's very different than what had been happening years ago. The reserve requirements are extremely low now, and they're taking advantage of that. They're trying to get that to actually come down, and they probably will. They'll get that uh, to be another issue in the future, clearly. Let's keep our eyes on that Fed deposit. Now, think about this. If you are an investor, if you are just trying to save, you need to be aware of all of these different types of statistics where your money can be kept. And of course, we need to understand that there are insured deposits and there are not insured deposits. And the one that's very important to keep note of is that Despite we, the fact that we have insured deposits, I would not trust it as far as I can throw it. 
my thoughts are that when they implement bail-ins, that they will first go for the non-insured, anything over 100,000. However, they will come for all of them. So don't put any money in there that you're not willing to risk. So where do you put your money? We have to keep it in assets. Look, if you have a bank account, you're getting your paycheck from work, it's going in there, and that's where you keep your savings. That's just a small pile, and then you end up buying you know, this or that. Uh, maybe put it on your mortgage, maybe buying precious metals or whatever, and you just have some in there because you need to buy groceries, you need to pay for your bills. That's totally understandable. That's obvious. That's the advantage of having a bank because you can do these transactions easily. But to keep savings, to keep all of your savings in there, not a good idea. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, please give me a thumbs up. Last but not least, if you found this video informative, I know you'll find my books, The Money GPS, and my newer release, Global Economic Collapse, even more informative. You can flip through these books. Go over to Amazon. There's a link in the description of this video. It will take you over there. And you can flip through the books for yourself. Take care.